the heart sutra prajna paramita pradeya sutra xing jing translated from sanskrit to chinese by shen Tsang. translated from chinese to english by the reverend samuel beale this librivox recording is in the public domain avalokiteshvara when the prajna paramita has been fully practiced then we clearly behold that the five skanda are all empty vain and unreal so it is we escape the possibility of sorrow or obstruction sariputra that which we call form is not different from that which we call space space is not different from form form is the same as space space is the same as form and so with the other skandhas whether vedana or sanjna or sanskara or vijnana they are each the same as their opposite sariputra all these things around us being thus stripped or devoid of qualities there can be no longer birth or death defilement or purity addition or destruction in the midst then of this void there can be neither rupa vedana sanjna sanskara or vijnana nor yet organs of sense whether the eye or nose ear or tongue body or mind nor yet objects of sense matter or sound odor or taste touch or ideas nor yet categories of sense such as the union of the object and subject in sight in smell in touch in taste in apprehension so there will be no such thing as ignorance nor yet freedom from ignorance and therefore there can be none of its consequences the twelve nidhyanas and therefore no such thing as decay or death nor yet freedom from decay and death so neither can there be a method for destroying the concourse of sorrows no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as attaining as there will not be aught that can be attained the bodhisattva resting on this prajna paramita no sorrow or obstruction can then affect his heart for there will be no such thing as sorrow or obstruction therefore having no fear or apprehension of evil removing far from him all the distorting influences of elusive thought he arrives at the goal of nirvana the buddhas of the three ages relying on this prajna paramita have arrived at the unsurpassed and enlightened condition therefore we know that this prajna paramita is the great spiritual dharani it is the great light giving dharani this is the unsurpassed dharani this is the unequalled dharani able to destroy all sorrows true and real not vain therefore we repeat the prajna paramita dharani then also say jie di jie di bo luo jie di bo luo sung jie di pu ti sa po he ga ti ga ti para ga ti para sang ga ti bo ri swa ha end of the heart sutra the diamond sutra ching kang ching or prajna 
Paramita, translated from Sanskrit to Chinese by Kumara Jiva, translated from Chinese to English by William Gimmel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1. Thus have I heard concerning our Lord Buddha. Upon a memorable occasion, the Lord Buddha sojourned in the kingdom of Shravasti, lodging in the grove of Jeddah, a park within the imperial domain which Jeddah, the heir apparent, bestowed upon Sitana, a benevolent minister of state, renowned for his charities and benefactions. With the Lord Buddha there were assembled together twelve hundred and fifty mendicant disciples, all of whom had attained to eminent degrees of spiritual wisdom. As it approached the hour for the morning meal, Lord Buddha, honored of the worlds, attired himself in a mendicant's robe, and bearing an alms bowl in his hands, walked towards the great city of Shravasti, which he entered to beg for food. Within the city he proceeded from door to door, and received such donations as the good people severally bestowed. Concluding this religious exercise, the Lord Buddha returned to the grove of Jetta, and partook of the frugal meal, received as alms. Thereafter he divested himself of his mendicant's robe, laid aside the venerated alms bowl, bathed his sacred feet, and accepted the honored seat reserved for him by his disciples. 2. Upon that occasion, the venerable Sabuti occupied a place in the midst of the assembly. Rising from his seat, with cloak arranged in such manner that his right shoulder was disclosed, Subuti knelt upon his right knee. Then, pressing together the palms of his hands, he respectfully raised them towards Lord Buddha, saying, Thou art of transcendent wisdom, honored of the worlds. With wonderful solicitude thou dost preserve in the faith and instruct in the law this illustrious assembly of enlightened disciples. Honored of the worlds, if a good disciple, whether man or woman, seeks to obtain supreme spiritual wisdom, what immutable law shall sustain the mind of that disciple and bring into subjection every inordinate desire? The Lord Buddha replied to Sabuti, saying, Truly a most excellent theme. As you affirmed, I preserve in the faith and instruct in the law this illustrious assembly of enlightened disciples. Attend diligently unto me, and I shall enunciate a law whereby the mind of a good disciple, whether man or woman, seeking to obtain supreme spiritual wisdom, shall be adequately sustained and enabled to bring into subjection every inordinate desire. Sabuti was gratified and signified glad consent. Thereupon the Lord Buddha, with majesty of person and perfect articulation, proceeded to deliver the text of this scripture, saying, 3 and 4. By this wisdom shall enlightened disciples be enabled to bring into subjection every inordinate desire. Every species of life, whether hatched in the egg, formed in the womb, evolved from spawn, produced by metamorphosis, with or without form or intelligence, possessing or devoid of natural instinct, from these changeful conditions of being I command you to seek deliverance in the transcendental concept of nirvana. Thus, you shall be delivered from an immeasurable, innumerable, and illimitable world of sentient life. But, in reality, there is no world of sentient life from which to seek deliverance. And why? 
because in the minds of enlightened disciples there have ceased to exist such arbitrary concepts of phenomena as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality. Moreover, Subhuti, an enlightened disciple ought to act spontaneously in the exercise of charity, uninfluenced by sensuous phenomena, such as sound, odor, taste, touch, or law. Subhuti, it is imperative that an enlightened disciple in the exercise of charity should act independently of phenomena. And why? Because acting without regard to elusive forms of phenomena, he will realize in the exercise of charity a merit inestimable and immeasurable. Subhuti, what think you? Is it possible to estimate the distance comprising the illimitable universe of space? Subhuti replied, saying, Honored of the worlds, it is impossible to estimate the distance comprising the illimitable universe of space. The Lord Buddha thereupon discoursed, saying, It is equally impossible to estimate the merit of an enlightened disciple who discharges the exercise of charity, unperturbed by the seductive influences of phenomena. Subhuti, the mind of an enlightened disciple ought thus to be indoctrinated. 5. The Lord Buddha interrogated Subhuti, saying, What think you? Is it possible that by means of his physical body the Lord Buddha may be clearly perceived? Subhuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds, it is impossible that by means of his physical body the Lord Buddha may be clearly perceived. And why? Because what the Lord Buddha referred to as a physical body is in reality not merely a physical body. Thereupon the Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, Every form or quality of phenomena is transient and elusive. When the mind realizes that the phenomena of life are not real phenomena, the Lord Buddha may then be clearly perceived. 6. Subhuti inquired of the Lord Buddha, saying, Honored of the worlds, in future ages, when this scripture is proclaimed amongst those beings destined to hear, Shall any conceive within their minds a sincere, unmingled faith? The Lord Buddha replied to Subhuti, saying, Have no such apprehensive thought. Even at the remote period of five centuries, subsequent to the nirvana of the Lord Buddha, there will be many disciples observing the monastic vows, and assiduously devoted to good works. These, hearing this scripture proclaimed, will believe in its immutability, and similarly conceive within their minds a pure, unmingled faith. Besides, it is important to realize that faith thus conceived is not exclusively in virtue of the insular thought of any particular Buddha, but because of its affiliation with the concrete thoughts of myriad Buddhas throughout infinite ages. Therefore, amongst the beings destined to hear this scripture proclaimed, many, by momentary reflection, will intuitively conceive a pure and holy faith. Subhuti, the Lord Buddha, by his prescience, is perfectly cognizant of all such potential disciples, and for these also there is reserved an immeasurable merit. And why? because the minds of these disciples will not revert to such arbitrary concepts of phenomena as an entity, a being, a living being, a personality, qualities or ideas coincident with law, or existing apart from the idea of law. And why? Because, assuming the permanency and reality of phenomena, 
the minds of these disciples would be involved in such distinctive ideas as an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality. Affirming the permanency and reality of qualities or ideas coincident with law, their minds would inevitably be involved in resolving these same definitions. Postulating the inviolate nature of qualities or ideas which have an existence apart from the law, there yet remain to be explained these abstruse distinctions. An entity, a being, a living being, and a personality. Therefore, enlightened disciples ought not to affirm the permanency or reality of qualities or ideas coincident with law, nor postulate as being of an inviolate nature qualities or ideas having an existence apart from the concept of law. Thus, we are enabled to appreciate the significance of those words which the Lord Buddha invariably repeated to his followers. You disciples must realize that the law which I enunciated was presented before your minds in the simile of a raft. If the law, having fulfilled its function in bearing you to the other shore, nirvana, with its coincident qualities and ideas must inevitably be abandoned, how much more inevitable must be the abandonment of qualities or ideas which have an existence apart from the law. 7. The Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, What think you? Has the Lord Buddha really attained to supreme spiritual wisdom? Or has he a system of doctrine which can be specifically formulated? Subhuti replied, saying, As I understand the meaning of the Lord Buddha's discourse, he has no system of doctrine which can be specifically formulated, nor can the Lord Buddha express in explicit terms a form of knowledge which can be described as supreme spiritual wisdom. And why? because what the Lord Buddha adumbrated in terms of the law is transcendental and inexpressible. Being a purely spiritual concept, it is neither consonant with law nor synonymous with anything apart from the law. Thus is exemplified the manner by which wise disciples and holy Buddhas, regarding intuition as the law of their minds, severally attain to different planes of spiritual wisdom. 8. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, What think you? If a benevolent person bestowed as alms an abundance of the seven treasures sufficient to fill the universe, would there accrue to that person a considerable merit? Sabuti replied, saying, A very considerable merit, honored of the worlds. And why? because what is referred to does not partake of the nature of ordinary merit, and in this sense the Lord Buddha made mention of a considerable merit. The Lord Buddha rejoined, saying, If a disciple adhered with implicit faith to a stanza of this scripture, and diligently explained it to others, the intrinsic merit of that disciple would be relatively greater. And why? Because Subhuti, the holy Buddhas, and the law by which they attain to supreme spiritual wisdom, severally owe their inception to the truth of this sacred scripture. Subhuti, what is ordinarily termed the Buddhic law, is not really a law attributive to Buddha. 9. The Lord Buddha inquired of Sabuti, saying, What think you? May a Skrotapati, having entered the stream which bears on to Nirvana, thus moralize within himself, I have obtained the fruits commensurate with the merit of a Skrotapati. Sabuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds. And why? Because 
scordopati is simply a descriptive term signifying having entered the stream. A disciple who avoids the seductive phenomena of form, sound, odor, taste, touch, and law is named a scrotapati. The Lord Buddha again inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? May a Sakridagami, who is subject only to one more reincarnation, thus muse within himself, I have obtained the fruits, consonant with the merit of a Sakridagami. Sabuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds. And why? Because Sakridagami is merely a descriptive title denoting only one more reincarnation. But in reality, there is no such condition as only one more reincarnation. Hence, Sakridagami is merely a descriptive title. The Lord Buddha once again inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you, may an anagami, having entire immunity from reincarnation, thus reflect within himself, I have obtained the fruits which accord with the merit of an anagami? Subhuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds. And why? Because anagami is merely a designation meaning immunity from reincarnation. But in reality, there is no such condition as immunity from reincarnation. Hence, anagami is merely a convenient designation. The Lord Buddha yet again inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? Man arhat, having attained to absolute quiescence of mind, thus meditate within himself. I have obtained the condition of an arhat. Sabuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds. And why? Because there is not in reality a condition synonymous with the term arhat. Honored of the worlds, if an arhat thus meditates within himself, I have obtained the condition of an arhat. There would be obvious recurrence of such arbitrary concepts as an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality. Honored of the worlds, when the Lord Buddha declared that in absolute quiescence of mind, perfect observance of the law, and true spiritual perception, I was preeminent amongst the disciples, I did not cogitate thus within myself. I am an arhat, freed from desire. Had I thus cogitated, I have obtained the condition of an arhat. The honored of the worlds would not have declared concerning me, Sabuti, delights in the austerities practiced by the Aranyaka. But in reality, Sabuti was perfectly quiescent and oblivious to phenomena. Hence the illusion, Sabuti delights in the austerities practiced by the Aranyaka. 10. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, What think you? When the Lord Buddha in a previous life was a disciple of Dipankara Buddha, was there communicated to him any prescribed law or system of doctrine, whereby he eventually became a Buddha? Sabuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds. When the Lord Buddha was a disciple of Dipankara Buddha, neither prescribed law nor system of doctrine was communicated to him, whereby he eventually became a Buddha. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, What think you? May an enlightened disciple thus ponder within himself, I shall create numerous Buddhist kingdoms. Sabuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds. And why? Because kingdoms thus created would not in reality be Buddhist kingdoms. Therefore, the creation of numerous Buddhist kingdoms is merely a figure of speech. The Lord Buddha, continuing, addressed Sabuti, saying, Enlightened disciples, ought therefore to engender within themselves a pure and holy mind. 
they ought not to depend on the phenomena of form, sound, odor, taste, touch, or law. They ought to sedulously cultivate a mind independent of every material aid. The Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, Supposing a man with a body as pretentious as Sumeru, prince among mountains, would you esteem such a body as being great? Subhuti replied, saying, Exceedingly great, honored of the worlds. And why? Because the Lord Buddha referred not to a physical body, but to mental and spiritual concepts of bodies, in which sense a body may be regarded as really great. 11. The Lord Buddha addressed Subhuti, saying, If there were rivers Ganges, as numerous as the sands of the Ganges, would the aggregate grains of sand be of considerable number? Subhuti replied, saying, A very considerable number, honored of the worlds. The rivers Ganges alone would be innumerable, and much more innumerable would be the grains of sand. The Lord Buddha thereupon addressed Subhuti, saying, I have a truth to declare unto you. If a good disciple, whether man or woman, were to bestow in the exercise of charity an abundance of the seven treasures, sufficient to fill as many boundless universes as there would be grains of sand in these innumerable rivers, would the cumulative merit of such a disciple be considerable? Subhuti so replied, saying, Very considerable, honored of the worlds. The Lord Buddha then declared unto Subhuti, If a good disciple, whether man or woman, were with implicit faith to adhere to a stanza of this scripture and diligently explain it to others, the consequent merit would be relatively greater than the other. 12. The Lord Buddha, continuing, said unto Subhuti, Wherever this scripture is proclaimed, even though it were but a stanza comprising four lines, you should realize that that place would be sanctified by the presence of the whole realm of gods, men, and terrestrial spirits, who ought unitedly to worship, as if before a sacred shrine of Buddha. But what encomium shall express the merit of a disciple who rigorously observes and diligently studies the text of this scripture? Sabuti, you should realize that such a disciple will be endowed with spiritual powers commensurate with initiation in the supreme, incomparable, and most wonderful law. Whatever place constitutes a repository for this sacred scripture, there also the Lord Buddha may be found together with disciples worthy of reverence and honor. 13. Upon that occasion, Subhuti inquired of the Lord Buddha, saying, Honored of the worlds, by what name shall this scripture be known, that we may regard it with reverence? The Lord Buddha replied, saying, Subhuti, this scripture shall be known as the Diamond Sutra, the transcendent wisdom, by means of which we reach the other shore. By this name you shall reverently regard it. And why, Sabuti? What the Lord Buddha declared as transcendent wisdom, by means of which we reach the other shore, is not essentially transcendent wisdom. In its essence it transcends all wisdom. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, What think you? Did the Lord Buddha formulate a precise system of law or doctrine? Sabuti replied, saying, Honored of the worlds, the Lord Buddha did not formulate a precise system of law or doctrine. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, What think you? Within the myriad worlds which comprise this universe, are the atoms of dust numerous? Sabuti replied, saying, Very numerous, honored of the worlds. The Lord Buddha, continuing his discourse, said, Sabuti, the Lord Buddha declares that all these atoms of dust 
are not essentially atoms of dust. They are merely termed atoms of dust. The Lord Buddha also declares that those myriad worlds are not really myriad worlds. They are merely designated myriad worlds. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, What think you? Can the Lord Buddha be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions? Sabuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds. The Lord Buddha cannot be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions. And why? Because what the Lord Buddha referred to as his thirty-two bodily distinctions are not in reality bodily distinctions. They are merely defined as bodily distinctions. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, If a good disciple, whether man or woman, day by day sacrificed lives innumerable as the sands of the Ganges, and if another disciple adhered with implicit faith to a stanza of this scripture and diligently explained it to others, the intrinsic merit of such a disciple would be relatively greater than the other. 14. Upon that occasion, the venerable Sabuti, hearing the text of this scripture proclaimed, and profoundly realizing its meaning, was moved to tears. Addressing the Lord Buddha, he said, Thou art of transcendent wisdom, honored of the worlds. The Lord Buddha, in expounding this supreme canon of scripture, surpassed in perspicuity every exposition previously heard by me, since my eyes were privileged to perceive this most excellent wisdom. Honored of the worlds, in years to come, if disciples, hearing this scripture proclaimed, and having within their minds a pure and holy faith, engender true concepts of the ephemeral nature of phenomena, we ought to realize that the cumulative merit of such disciples will be intrinsic and wonderful. Honored of the worlds, the true concept of phenomena is that these are not essentially phenomena, and hence the Lord Buddha declared that they are merely termed phenomena. Honored of the worlds, having heard this unprecedented scripture, faith, clear understanding, and firm resolve to observe its precepts follow as a natural sequence. If in future ages disciples destined to hear this scripture likewise believe, understand, and observe its precepts, their merit will incite the highest wonder and praise. And why? Because the minds of those disciples will have outgrown such arbitrary ideas of phenomena as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality. And why? Because the entity is in reality non-entity, and a being, a living being, or a personality, are ideas equally nebulous and hypothetical. Wherefore, discarding every arbitrary idea of phenomena, the wise and wholly enlightened were severally designated Buddha. The Lord Buddha, assenting, said unto Sabuti, If in future ages disciples destined to hear this scripture neither become perturbed by its extreme modes of thought, nor alarmed by its lofty sentiments, nor apprehensive about realizing its high ideals, these disciples also by their intrinsic merit will incite superlative wonder and praise. Sabuti, what the Lord Buddha referred to as the first paramita, charity, is not in reality the first paramita. It is merely termed the first paramita. Sabuti, regarding the third paramita, endurance, it is not in reality a paramita. It is merely termed a paramita. And why? Because in a previous life, when the prince of Kalinga, Kaliraja, severed the flesh from my limbs and body, 
at that time I was oblivious to such arbitrary ideas of phenomena as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality. And why? Because upon that occasion, when my limbs and body were rent asunder, had I not been oblivious to such arbitrary ideas as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality, there would have originated within my mind feelings of anger and resentment. Subhuti, five hundred incarnations ago, I recollect that as a recluse, practicing the ordinances of the Kshanti Paramita, even then I had no such arbitrary ideas as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality. Therefore, Sabuti, an enlightened disciple ought to discard as being unreal and elusive every conceivable form of phenomena. In aspiring to supreme spiritual wisdom, the mind ought to be insensible to every sensuous influence, and independent of everything pertaining to sound, odor, taste, touch, or law. There ought to be cultivated a condition of complete independence of mind, because if the mind is depending upon any external aid, it is obviously deluded. There is, in reality, nothing external to depend upon. Therefore, the Lord Buddha declared that in the exercise of charity, the mind of an enlightened disciple ought not to depend upon any form of phenomena. Saputi, an enlightened disciple, desirous to confer benefits upon the whole realm of being, ought thus to be animated in the exercise of charity. The Lord Buddha, in declaring the unreality of phenomena, also affirmed that the whole realm of sentient life is ephemeral and illusory. Sabuti, the sayings of the Lord Buddha are true, credible, and immutable. His utterances are neither extravagant nor chimerical. Sabuti, the plane of thought to which the Lord Buddha attained, cannot be explained in terms synonymous with reality or non-reality. Sabuti, in the exercise of charity, if the mind of an enlightened disciple is not independent of every law, he is like unto a person having entered impenetrable darkness, and to whom every object is invisible. But an enlightened disciple, discharging the exercise of charity with a mind independent of every law, is like unto a person having the power of vision, in the meridian glory of the sunlight, and to whom every object is visible. Saputi, in future ages, if a good disciple, whether man or woman, rigorously studies and observes the text of this scripture, the Lord Buddha, by means of his Buddhic wisdom, entirely knows and perceives that for such a disciple there is reserved a cumulative merit, immeasurable and illimitable. 15. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, If a good disciple, whether man or woman, in the morning, at noonday, and at eventide, sacrificed lives innumerable as the sands of the Ganges, and thus without intermission throughout infinite ages. And if another disciple, hearing this scripture proclaimed, steadfastly believed it, his felicity would be appreciably greater than the other. But how much greater must be the felicity of a disciple who transcribes the sacred text, observes its precepts, studies its laws, and repeats the scripture, that others may be edified thereby. Sabuti, the relative importance of this scripture may thus be summarily stated. Its truth is infinite, its worth incomparable, and its merit interminable. The Lord Buddha delivered this scripture specifically for those who are entered upon the path which leads to nirvana, and for those who are attaining to the ultimate plane of Buddhic thought. 
If a disciple rigorously observes, studies, and widely disseminates the knowledge of this scripture, the Lord Buddha entirely knows and perceives that for such an one there will be a cumulative merit, immeasurable, incomparable, illimitable, and inconceivable. All such disciples will be endowed with transcendent Buddhic wisdom and enlightenment. And why? Because, Sabuti, if a disciple takes pleasure in a narrow or exclusive form of the law, he cannot receive with gratification the instruction of this scripture, or delight in its study, or fervently explain it to others. Sabuti, in whatever place there is a repository for this scripture, the whole realm of spiritual beings ought to adore it, and reverencing it as a sacred shrine, ceremoniously surround it, scattering profusely sweet-scented flowers and pure odors of fragrant incense. 16. The Lord Buddha, continuing, addressed Sabuti, saying, If a good disciple, whether man or woman, devoted to the observance and study of this scripture, is thereby despised or lightly esteemed, it is because that in a previous life there had been committed some grievous transgression, followed now by inexorable retribution. But although in this life despised or lightly esteemed, the compensating merit thus acquired will cause the transgression of a former life to be fully expiated, and the disciple adequately recompensed by the attainment of supreme spiritual wisdom. Furthermore, Sabuti, numberless ages ago, I recollect that before the advent of the Pankara Buddha, there were myriad Buddhas before whom I served and received religious instruction, my conduct being entirely blameless and without reproach. But in the ages to come, if a disciple be enabled to rigorously observe and to study the text of this scripture, the merit thus acquired will so far exceed the measure of my merit in the service of those myriad Buddhas, that it cannot be stated in terms of proportion, nor comprehended by means of any analogy. Again, Sabhuti, in future ages, if a good disciple, whether man or woman, be enabled to rigorously observe and to study consecutively the texts of this scripture, were I to elaborate either the nature or extent of this merit, those who heard it might become delirious, or entirely doubt its credibility. Sabuti, it is necessary to realize that, as the meaning of this scripture is beyond ordinary comprehension, the scope of its fruitful rewards is equally incomprehensible. 17. Upon that occasion, the venerable Sabuti addressed the Lord Buddha, saying, Honored of the worlds, if a good disciple, whether man or woman, having desired to attain to supreme spiritual wisdom, what immutable law shall support the mind of that disciple and bring into subjection every inordinate desire? The Lord Buddha replied, saying, A good disciple, whether man or woman, ought thus to habituate his mind, I must become oblivious to every idea of sentient life, and having become oblivious to every idea of sentient life, there is no one to whom the idea of sentient life has become oblivious. And why? Because, Sabuti, if an enlightened disciple retains within his mind such arbitrary ideas of sentient life as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality, he has not attained to supreme spiritual wisdom. And why? Because, Sabuti, there is no law by means of which a disciple may be defined as one having obtained supreme spiritual wisdom. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, What think you? When the Lord Buddha was a disciple of Dipankara Buddha, was there bequeathed to him any law whereby he attained to supreme spiritual wisdom. 
Sabuti replied, saying, No, honored of the worlds, inasmuch as I am able to comprehend the meaning of the Lord Buddha's discourse, when the Lord Buddha was a disciple of Dipankara Buddha, there was no law bequeathed to him whereby he attained to supreme spiritual wisdom. The Lord Buddha endorsed these words, saying, Truly, there is no law by means of which the Lord Buddha obtained supreme spiritual wisdom. Sabuti, if there existed a law by means of which the Lord Buddha obtained supreme spiritual wisdom, Dipankara Buddha would not have foretold at my initiation, In future ages thou shalt become Sakyamuni Buddha. But in reality there is no law by means of which supreme spiritual wisdom can be obtained. Therefore, at my initiation, Dipankara Buddha foretold concerning me, In future ages thou shalt become Sakyamuni Buddha. And why? Because in the word Buddha, every law is summarily and intelligibly comprehended. If a disciple affirmed that the Lord Buddha attained to supreme spiritual wisdom, it is necessary to state that there is no law whereby this condition of mind can be realized. The supreme spiritual wisdom to which the Lord Buddha attained cannot in its essence be defined as real or unreal. Thus, the Lord Buddha declared that the ordinarily accepted term, the Buddhic law, is synonymous with every moral and spiritual law. Sabuti, what are ordinarily declared to be systems of law are not in reality systems of law. They are merely termed systems of law. The Lord Buddha inquired of Sabuti, saying, Can you imagine a man having a great physical body? Sabhuti replied, saying, The Lord Buddha, discoursing upon the proportions of a physical body, did not maintain for these any real greatness. Therefore, it is merely termed a great body. The Lord Buddha thereupon addressed Sabhuti, saying, Thus it is with an enlightened disciple. If he were to expatiate after this manner, I must become oblivious to every idea of sentient life. He could not be described as fully enlightened. And why? Because there is no law whereby a disciple can be approved as fully enlightened. Therefore, the Lord Buddha declared that within the realm of spiritual law there is neither an entity, a being, a living being, nor a personality. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, If an enlightened disciple were to speak in this wise, I shall create numerous Buddhist kingdoms. He could not be designated fully enlightened. And why? Because the Lord Buddha, discoursing upon creating numerous Buddhist kingdoms, did not affirm the idea of creating numerous material Buddhist kingdoms. Hence, the creation of numerous Buddhist kingdoms is merely a figure of speech. Sabuti, the Lord Buddha, declared that a disciple may be regarded as truly enlightened, whose mind is thoroughly imbued with the law of non-individuality. 18. The Lord Buddha inquired of Sabuti, saying, What think you? Does the Lord Buddha possess the physical eye? Sabuti assented, saying, Honored of the worlds, the Lord Buddha truly possesses the physical eye. The Lord Buddha inquired of Sabuti, saying, What think you? Does the Lord Buddha possess the divine or spiritual eye? Sabuti assented, saying, Honored of the worlds, the Lord Buddha truly possesses the divine or spiritual eye. The Lord Buddha inquired of Sabuti, saying, What think you? Does the Lord Buddha possess the eye of wisdom? Sabuti assented, saying, Honored of the worlds. The Lord Buddha truly possesses the eye of wisdom. The Lord Buddha inquired of Sabuti, saying, What think you? 
does the Lord Buddha possess the eye of truth? Subhuti assented, saying, Honored of the worlds, the Lord Buddha truly possesses the eye of truth. The Lord Buddha inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? Does the Lord Buddha possess the Buddhic eye? Subhuti assented, saying, Honored of the worlds, the Lord Buddha truly possesses the Buddhic eye. The Lord Buddha inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? Concerning the sands of the Ganges, did the Lord Buddha declare that these were grains of sand? Subhuti assenting, said, Honored of the worlds, the Lord Buddha declared that these were grains of sand. The Lord Buddha inquired of Subhuti, saying, What think you? If there were as many rivers, Ganges, as there are grains of sand in the Ganges, and if there were as many Buddhist worlds as the grains of sand in those innumerable rivers, would these Buddhist worlds be numerous? Subhuti replied, saying, Honored of the worlds, these Buddhist worlds would be very numerous. The Lord Buddha, continuing, addressed Sabuti, saying, Within these innumerable worlds, every form of sentient life, with their various mental dispositions, are entirely known to the Lord Buddha. And why? Because what the Lord Buddha referred to as their various mental dispositions are not in reality their various mental dispositions. These are merely termed their various mental dispositions. And why? Because, Sabhuti, dispositions of mind or modes of thought, whether relating to the past, the present, or the future, are alike unreal and illusory. 19. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabhuti, saying, What think you? If a disciple, having obtained all the treasures of this universe, were to bestow these in the exercise of charity, would such a disciple consequently enjoy a considerable merit? Sabuti assenting said, Honored of the worlds, such a disciple would consequently enjoy a very considerable merit. The Lord Buddha thereupon addressed Sabuti, saying, If there were any real or permanent quality in merit, the Lord Buddha would not have spoken of such merit as considerable. It is because there is neither a tangible nor material quality in merit that the Lord Buddha referred to the merit of that disciple as considerable. 20. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, What think you? Can the Lord Buddha be perceived by means of his perfect material body? Sabuti replied, saying, Honored of the worlds, it is improbable that the Lord Buddha can be perceived by means of his perfect material body. And why? Because what the Lord Buddha referred to as a perfect material body is not in reality a perfect material body. It is merely termed a perfect material body. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, What think you? Can the Lord Buddha be perceived by means of any physical phenomena? Sabuti replied, saying, Honored of the worlds, it is improbable that the Lord Buddha can be perceived by means of any physical phenomena. And why? Because what the Lord Buddha referred to as physical phenomena are not in reality physical phenomena. These are merely termed physical phenomena. 21. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, Do not affirm that the Lord Buddha thinks less within himself. I ought to promulgate a system of law or doctrine. Have no such irrelevant thought. And why? Because if a disciple affirmed that the Lord Buddha promulgated a system of law or doctrine, he would defame the Lord Buddha being manifestly unable to understand the purport of my instruction. Sabhuti, regarding the promulgation of a system of law or doctrine, there is in reality 
no system of law or doctrine to promulgate. It is merely termed a system of law or doctrine. Upon that occasion, the virtuous and venerable Sabhuti inquired of the Lord Buddha, saying, Honored of the worlds, in ages to come will sentient beings destined to hear this law engender within their minds the essential elements of faith. The Lord Buddha replied, saying, Sabhuti, it cannot be asserted that these are sentient beings, or that these are not sentient beings. And why? Because, Sabhuti, regarding sentient beings, the Lord Buddha declared that in reality these are not sentient beings. They are merely termed sentient beings. 22. Sabhuti inquired of the Lord Buddha, saying, Honored of the worlds. Did the Lord Buddha, in attaining to supreme spiritual wisdom, obtain nothing of a real or tangible nature? The Lord Buddha replied, saying, In attaining to supreme spiritual wisdom, not a vestige of law or doctrine was obtained, and therefore it is termed supreme spiritual wisdom. 23. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabhuti, saying, This law is coherent and indivisible. It is neither above nor below. Therefore, it is termed supreme spiritual wisdom. It excludes such arbitrary ideas as an entity, a being, a living being, or a personality, but includes every law pertaining to the cultivation of goodness. Sabhuti, what were referred to as laws pertaining to goodness, these, the Lord Buddha declared, are not in reality laws pertaining to goodness. They are merely termed laws pertaining to goodness. 24. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabhuti, saying, If within this universe of universes the seven treasures were heaped together, forming as many great elevations as there are Sumerus, prince of mountains, and these treasures bestowed entirely in the exercise of charity. And if a disciple were to select a stanza of this scripture, rigorously observe it, and diligently explain it to others, the merit thus obtained would so far exceed the former excellence that it cannot be stated in terms of proportion nor comprehended by any analogy. 25. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabhuti, saying, What think you? You disciples do not affirm that the Lord Buddha reflects thus within himself. I bring salvation to every living being. Sabhuti, entertain no such delusive thought. And why? Because in reality there are no living beings to whom the Lord Buddha can bring salvation. If there were living beings to whom the Lord Buddha could bring salvation, the Lord Buddha would necessarily assume the reality of such arbitrary concepts as an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality. Sabhuti, what the Lord Buddha adverted to as an entity is not in reality an entity. It is only understood to be an entity, and believed in as such by the common uneducated people. Sabhuti, what are ordinarily referred to as the common uneducated people, these the Lord Buddha declared to be not merely common uneducated people. 26. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabhuti, saying, can the Lord Buddha be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions? Sabhuti replied, saying, Even so, the Lord Buddha can be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions. The Lord Buddha, continuing, said unto Sabhuti, If by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions it were possible to perceive the Lord Buddha, then the Lord Buddha would merely resemble one of the great wheel-turning kings. Sabhuti 
thereupon addressed the Lord Buddha, saying, Honored of the worlds, according as I am able to interpret the Lord Buddha's instruction, it is improbable that the Lord Buddha may be perceived by means of his thirty-two bodily distinctions. Thereafter, the honored of the worlds delivered this sublime gata. I am not to be perceived by means of any visible form, nor sought after by means of any audible sound. Whosoever walks in the way of iniquity cannot perceive the blessedness of the Lord Buddha. 27. The Lord Buddha said unto Sabhuti, If you think thus within yourself, the Lord Buddha did not, by means of his perfect bodily distinctions, obtain supreme spiritual wisdom. Sabhuti, have no such deceptive thought. Or, if you think thus within yourself, in obtaining supreme spiritual wisdom, the Lord Buddha declared the abrogation of every law. Sabuti, have no such delusive thought. And why? Because those disciples who obtain supreme spiritual wisdom neither affirm the abrogation of any law nor the destruction of any distinctive quality of phenomena. 28. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabhuti, saying, If an enlightened disciple, in the exercise of charity, bestowed as considerable an amount of the seven treasures as might fill worlds numerous as the sands of the Ganges, and if a disciple realizing that within the meaning and purport of the law there is no abstract individual existence, perfects himself in the virtue of endurance. This latter disciple will have a cumulative merit relatively greater than the other. And why? Because enlightened disciples are entirely unaffected by considerations of reward or merit. Sabhuti thereupon inquired of the Lord Buddha, saying, Honored of the worlds, in what respect are enlightened disciples unaffected by considerations of reward or merit? The Lord Buddha replied, saying, Enlightened disciples do not aspire in a spirit of covetousness to rewards commensurate with their merit. Therefore, I declare that they are entirely unaffected by considerations of reward or merit. 29. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabhuti, saying, If a disciple asserts that the Lord Buddha comes or goes, sits or reclines, obviously he has not understood the meaning of my discourse. And why? Because the idea Buddha implies neither coming from anywhere nor going to anywhere, and hence the synonym Buddha. 30. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabhuti, saying, If a good disciple, whether man or woman, were to take infinite worlds and reduce them to minute particles of dust, what think you? Would the aggregate of all those particles of dust be great? Sabhuti replied, saying, Honored of the worlds, the aggregate of all those particles of dust would be exceedingly great. And why? Because if all those were in reality minute particles of dust, the Lord Buddha would not have declared them to be minute particles of dust. And why? Because the Lord Buddha, discoursing upon minute particles of dust, declared that in reality, those are not minute particles of dust. They are merely termed minute particles of dust. Sabuti, continuing, addressed the Lord Buddha, saying, Honored of the worlds, what the Lord Buddha discoursed upon as infinite worlds, these are not in reality infinite worlds. They are merely termed infinite worlds. And why? because if these were in reality infinite worlds, there would, 
of necessity be unity and eternity of matter. But the Lord Buddha, discoursing upon the unity and eternity of matter, declared that there is neither unity nor eternity of matter. Therefore, it is merely termed unity and eternity of matter. The Lord Buddha thereupon declared unto Sabhuti, Belief in the unity or eternity of matter is incomprehensible, and only common, worldly-minded people, for purely materialistic reasons, covet this hypothesis. 31. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabhuti, saying, If a disciple affirmed that the Lord Buddha enunciated a belief that the mind can comprehend the idea of an entity, a being, a living being or a personality, what think you, Sabhuti? Would that disciple be interpreting aright the meaning of my discourse? Sabhuti replied, saying, Honored of the worlds, that disciple would not be interpreting aright the meaning of the Lord Buddha's discourse. And why? Because, honored of the worlds, discoursing upon comprehending such ideas as an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality, it was declared that these are entirely unreal and elusive, and therefore they are merely termed an entity, a being, a living being, and a personality. The Lord Buddha thereafter addressed Sabhuti, saying, Those who aspire to the attainment of supreme spiritual wisdom ought thus to know, believe in, and interpret phenomena. They ought to eliminate from their minds every tangible evidence of every visible object. Sabhuti, concerning visible objects, the Lord Buddha declared, that these are not really visible objects, they are merely termed visible objects. 32. The Lord Buddha addressed Sabuti, saying, If a disciple, having immeasurable spheres filled with the seven treasures, bestowed these in the exercise of charity, and if a disciple, whether man or woman, having aspired to supreme spiritual wisdom, selected from this scripture a stanza comprising four lines, then rigorously observed it, studied it, and diligently explained it to others. The cumulative merit of such a disciple would be relatively greater than the other. In what attitude of mind should it be diligently explained to others? Not assuming the permanency or the reality of earthly phenomena, but in the conscious blessedness of a mind at perfect rest. And why? Because the phenomena of life may be likened unto a dream, a phantasm, a bubble, a shadow, the glistening dew, or lightning flash, and thus they ought to be contemplated. When the Lord Buddha concluded his enunciation of this scripture, the venerable Saputi, the monks, nuns, lay brethren and sisters, all mortals, and the whole realm of spiritual beings, rejoiced exceedingly and consecrated to its practice. They received it and departed. End of chapter 32 As when men, travelling, feel a glorious perfume sweet, pervading all the countryside, and gladdening them, infer at once, surely tis giant forest trees are flowering now. So, conscious of this perfume sweet of righteousness that now pervades the earth and heavens, they may infer, a Buddha, infinitely great, must once have lived. End of the Diamond Sutra Translated by William Gemmel Metacoordinated by Avai Proof listened by Hope Read by Geoffrey Edwards in memory of Kahyan Cho We are here to help each other blossom.